There it sat, exactly as he described it. A black rectangle in the swamp. Muddy water sloshed around the ancient stone lip, but worn grooves directed any excess water away from the darkened grass. Wading forward through the muck, I took a closer look. Carved steps led down into pitch, their centers worn down by centuries of passing feet. Several children giggled at my visible fear and called out Spanish taunts. A moment later, they swarmed down the steps and into the murk, completely unafraid of the ominous horizontal portal. Their exacerbated parents quickly followed. I turned to my co-worker, who stood behind me in the humid evening gloom. You sure this is safe? I sleep three times, he responded, doing his best to reassure me in poor English. He looked extremely uncomfortable, standing still in the waist-high water. It wasn't my presence there that made him so anxious. He slapped a bug on his arm, and as he did so, I again studied his thumb, and now whole and healthy. I was willing to entertain the notion that something strange had happened to restore the thumb I'd seen him lose on the job the day before. But this impossible tunnel in the middle of Florida's swampland couldn't possibly have a medical miracle hidden within it. Could it? I prepared myself for a prank, even though my darker thoughts refused to fully take comfort. I'd seen his thumb fall. I watched as the poorly maintained machine had sliced right through the flesh on his hand, wondering if he'd be alright without health insurance or the ability to go to a hospital. I'd been unable to sleep the entire night. And then, I'd seen him take off the bandage off on the way out to work the next day, without a wound to be seen. I'd seen him flex and test his new thumb and then hurry away before any of our co-workers had seen the truth. My angry and confused pursuit had brought me along on this track with many neighbors from his community. They hadn't trusted me at first, but Javier had told them I was a good guy. On his word, they allowed me to come with him to this... some sort of odd community activity. I wasn't sure I was still glad for the opportunity. Musty, chill air hit my senses as I stepped down to those decaying stairs. The smoothly carved walls seemed to grow imperceptibly tighter the further down I moved, but I forced my pulse to slow and told myself that it was just my fearful imagination. Eventually, the only thing I saw behind and above me was a dim rectangle of foggy evening swamp light. Javier stood ahead of me, waiting as he shined his flashlight on a deep puddle at the base of the moldy stairs. I stepped across it onto damp rock. The tunnel led down at a slight angle, forming an endless rectangle of cramped space that seemed to go far on longer than I had the nerve for. As Javier led the way, I began to get the feeling that this tunnel might never actually end. A feeling strengthened by a very odd movement of air against my face that I had only begun to notice when every other sense had grown dull. There was a breeze moving against my cheeks and against my arms. I was certain of that now. The strange thing about it, though, was that it was completely even. I focused my awareness on my skin as we crept ever deeper, but I never felt a single ebb or flow. The air coming from below moved with an exacting evenness, as if pushed through the earth by some vast and unknown machine. The other detail that concerned me... It was warm. A friendly hand shot out and held me back. A frozen place. The vector of that eerily even breeze had changed and now come from the side. 
I can now see a dozen flashlights moving around to my left as the families and children moved along a heavy set ledge that curved off into the darkness. Here, Javier told me quietly, shining his light ahead to show me the hollowed place to which we had come. A few feet ahead of me, the stone ledge ceased, making my way for an enormous emptiness under a massive stone dome. Bit by bit, where the beam of light fell, I made sense of the space. It was utterly quiet. Calmer than any church, it sat like a perfect bubble under the earth, a natural cathedral. But it was not empty. Shining his light down, he showed me what lay beneath that emptiness. The ledge ran a full circle around the colossal space, but only inches below that, scant security ran a tremendous circle of shifting shadow. I stepped closer. He pulled me back, roughly. No. Respecting his concerns, I had him shine the light down for a few moments more as I tried to comprehend what I was seeing. The wide, curved, smooth vision below was clearly in motion, but made no noise. The longer I looked, the more I became certain that it had to be water. A monumental amount of water, spinning and circling down into a massive whirlpool. The shape was obvious, and the substance familiar, but my ears heard nothing. Understanding my confusion, Javier took a small rock and threw it forward. I watched it sail forth silently into that dizzying glass, frozen with anticipation. The moment it hit, the slight sound of rushing water reached my ears. As I watched the disturbance caused by the impact propagated throughout the vortex, and then the sound grew into a murmur, and then a roar, and then an almost painful crescendo of torrential noise. The families plugged their ears and waited, and I followed suit. About thirty seconds later, the entire mass of disturbed water circled in the center of the vortex and dipped unceremoniously into void. Silence fell once more. I understood then why it was so quiet. Whatever the source of this water was, the whole system had worn smooth path through living rock over the ages. The whirlpool had become preternaturally polished to the point that it no longer made any noise at all. Thus, we stood in complete silence and a natural cathedral that pumped out an unending breeze. But why was it warm? Sleep, Javier told me. Sleep here. He pointed to an alcove a little ways from where the families and children were setting up blankets. A small space offered slightly more protection from the naked edge of oblivion. I crawled in, studying the intricately engraved images within. Faded pink flecked from icons of Mary and Jesus as a child. Even older images beside that detailed a strange elephant with many arms. Below that, someone had worked ivory and bone into ancient carvings. Sleep, my friend said again. He held his thumb up to his light, and I noticed, for the first time, that the skin there was slightly lighter than the rest of his hand, as if it had not seen as much sun or sweat. If we sleep entire dream, healed. I wasn't sure I understood, but I felt no danger now that I understood the importance of this place to these people. This wasn't a prank, nor a trick, and many other people had clearly been here throughout the ages. I almost dared to believe that something mystical might happen here. But sleep entire dream, what, what did that mean? I tried to decipher his cryptic command, even as my head began to feel oddly heavy. My lungs seemed to fill with a calm warmth, and I slumped next to him against the elegant walls of the little alcove. A vanishingly thin tendril of electricity seemed to tug at my consciousness, pulling my awareness forward. 
The sensation was not overwhelming or fear-inducing. Rather, I sensed that I could pull back at any time, and pull back I did. I awoke slowly, highly aware of the precarious nature of the ledge I'd fallen asleep on. Looking around, I saw Javier and several other families sleeping by the glow of their flashlights. None seemed in danger. Slowly, I let myself nod off again. That thin cord of energy returned, pulling my thoughts and sensations out of my skull, and I let it happen, warily poised to pull back at the first sign of a trap. Floating black seemed to move around me, sliding past and then spinning one full rotation. Upside down, I felt my back press weakly against the ceiling. No, the floor. Soft dirt. Pushing forth, I fought my way out of soft resistance, sitting up only after great effort. I sat stunned for a time. A vast sky of rotting amber arced overhead, shot through my skeletal black fingers, arcing with imperial purple energies. I could sense that the dim, fiery sight would have been painful to behold had I normal, fleshy eyes. Touching my face, receiving only the weakest texture of impulses, I felt soft gore and feeble rot. A hole seemed to exist where my cheek should have been, and my eyes were but empty sockets. I watched my own finger as it slid within these sockets, feeling around in horror, and I sat shocked as that blackened, rotting digit moved first into my sight and then passed. Indeed, my whole body was... A skeletal and withered mockery of the human form, a decomposing corpse burst forth from the grave. In the distance, I saw several groups of corpses shambling along, and I knew them to be the families that I had accompanied. Above me, a decrepit cadaver urged me without words to rise. I knew somehow that this was my friend and co-worker. He motioned for silence, but I had no jaw in any case. If my eyes worked with empty sockets, might my voice have worked without a mouth? I chose not to risk it. Something was very wrong here, and I decided to follow his lead. Pulled completely out of the fragile earth, I wobbled on frail legs held together only by the barest strings of rotting muscle. More graves followed the area, and my empty eyes followed an ornate metal fence around to an entrance. The malformed children and their parents moved towards it. We followed. Beyond lay vast, empty tacks of blasted forest crowned by horizons filled with crumbling silhouettes of buildings. I could see no sun, but that rotting amber glow from the charged sky above lit everything with a dull, eerie cast. Traveling as quickly as their emaciated limbs would take them, the families ahead moved with fearful haste across the flattened sea of dead trees. We followed. Blackened, ramshackle buildings grew near, even as I became aware of a strange sound. I had no ears, but still, I heard. A world-filling, thumping, slow and powerful, at once organic and mechanical. I might have thought it a massive metal heart in the sky had I not already been well aware of that unhallowed sky above held nothing but blight and putrescence. I wondered to ask Javier what that sound was, but he shook his head to indicate continued silence. He heard it too. And somehow, I perceived fear in the half of a face he still carried. A new sound had slowly become louder than the first, a shuffling and a scraping and a great many creakings overshadowing the mysterious squishy mechanical heartbeat that otherwise filled the world. I had the distinct notion that these new sounds were much closer, perhaps even within sight against the spectral horizon, but... I saw nothing but weird shadows moving between distant silhouettes. Ahead, a deteriorating father held open a bolt hole for us at the base of a building. He waited for us to enter as quickly as possible and Javier moved ahead. 
I stopped. I recognized it. This was a hardware store a block off the main street of our small town. The sign, although unreadable, still remained in partial blackened ruin. Javier waved his stump of an arm at me, and those strange shuffling and scraping sounds grew closer, so I broke out of my fear to follow him through the hole into the basement of the building. The father and two other men pulled rocks and rubble down to seal us in, and we waited, huddled in phantasmal darkness. I could still see within that basement, although no light source was possible, and I saw families holding each other tightly and waiting for some great terror to pass. The hardware store's tools lay piled about, rusted and ruined by the passage of time. A single corpse sat in the corner, an old gun in its hand, the top of its head missing. Unlike us, it was not animated, and remained in place with that weird grin unique to bear skeleton and jaws. Grimes still remained where his gums had once been. I sank down as unearthly creakings began moving outside, mixed with scraping sighs and shuffling squishing. A legion of unknown abominations marched past our building, or perhaps one single unthinkable entity. Something heavy poked out at the rocks and rubble that sealed us in, and I felt a collective lungness breath held by our group. But then, the curious unknown thing moved on, apparently satisfied. The marching continued for an immeasurable eternity, and I felt our group growing more frightened. Was this all supposed to have ended already? Was this what Javier had said? Sleep, entire dream? Was this a nightmare then? And to be healed as he had been, we had to remain until the end? I still felt that tenuous little umbilical cord of electricity connecting me to my real body back in that cathedral cave by that impossible vortex. I knew that I could go back at any time, but would my cowardice cost these children their healing? Something snuffled outside the rubble of our building again, and a spike of fear almost sent me running back to reality, but I held on and closed my lidless eyes. Rock ruptured somewhere nearby, and children and adults screamed without lungs. Something penetrated the sanctity of our space, something metallic, massive, and wickedly bladed. Opening my eyes, I saw... No! At the last moment, my mental lifeline, back to my body, flared of its own accord. A searing white blur of electricity overtook my awareness, and I sat up gasping. Flashlights, concern, chatter, real breathing. I held my hand up and I saw it whole once more. Down the ledge, families checked on their children and happy shouts followed. I saw one family cutting the cast of a formerly broken arm and one child who'd been carried in now stood on his own. We made it. We'd stuck it out until the end. Javier shined his light roughly in my face. See now? You won't tell. Instead of responding immediately, I pulled my sleeve down, looking for a small scar that I'd had since high school. My heart leapt into my throat as I found my arm smooth and unblemished. You won't tell, he asked again. I stared back at him with wide eyes. No. I won't tell. He seemed relieved and held out a hand to lift me to my feet. No comeback. Bad luck if come back too much. Nodding, I pretended to agree with him. I decided at that moment to pretend like I'd been spiritually touched by the grace of that unreal place. I'd walk back with these people, thank them, and head home. Until tomorrow night... 
when nothing on earth could stop me from coming back here and finding out more. What force had healed these people and me? What had that insane dream world been about? What nightmares walked those devastated lands? And where had this ancient vortex come from? And what role did it play in what I'd experienced? I resolved to uncover all these things. All of this had to be explainable within the realms of science. Bad luck? I don't believe in bad luck. It joke's over. Let's go home. He complained, swatting at a bug near his arm. Hugh, it's not a joke. I scanned the dim evening orange gloom. I just have to find it. He pushed up his glasses, sighed, and continued waiting alongside me. Is this about your brother? I turned and glared at him, fighting a sudden energy in my arms and an urge to strike him. That heat left me as I saw a black rectangle jutting out from the water behind him. He saw my expression and turned, equally surprised to find that we nearly stumbled right past the object of our search. <sighs> it's really here. Yeah, I'm not kidding, I told him, carefully moving my raised arms as if I'd done it to remind him that my scar was gone. He shifted under the weight of his backpack, grimaced and shrugged. You first, then. I pulled two flashlights out of his pack and led the way down the mossy, ancient stairs. He followed only after I shot him another glare. The unwavering warm breeze remained exactly as before, but this time, I was the one in the lead. Despite the beam from my flashlight projecting out along the smoothly carved walls, pockmarked ceiling and damp floor, and making decent illuminating headway into the hazy darkness ahead, I still felt rather vulnerable. Javier's warning murmured at the back of my mind. What bad luck could I bring down upon myself by trespassing here? There didn't seem to be any holes, traps, or other dangers. Without the reverence, fear, and gaggle of children that had come along last time, the cramped walk went faster. I knew to look for the sudden ledge, and held Hugh to back as we emerged into the massive domed chamber. There it is, I told him, shining my light down at the eerily silent whirlpool. It's really there. He breathed, clutching the intricately carved walls out of fear of the edge. He glanced up at an ancient mural. That's... Seminole art, I think. Or Muskegee. Before them. Of all my weary silence, he turned his light toward me. Indigenous people. Like, two or three hundred years old. Oh, I replied, studying the depths of the chamber with my light. I saw Christian and Hindu stuff in one of the alcoves, and carved ivory and bone art. I'll scrape some samples, he thought out loud, taking out his backpack and placing it carefully on the ledge. Bending down while gripping the wall, he carefully searched through the jars he packed for this purpose. Shivering a bit, though probably not from the cool and that oddly warm breeze, he pulled out a rope. Tie this around something, will you? I don't like walking near this crazy instant death whirlpool thing. I snorted. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of it like that. But I guess that's what it is. I picked up the rope and stepped past him, unafraid. Despite the heat and moisture that riddled the tunnel down, the ledge here was dry as a bone and utterly smooth. Not so much as a speck of dust threatened to disrupt my footing. Traveling further along the circular ledge than my prior visit three nights before, I shined my light on both the flat stone ahead and the carvings, paintings, and alcoves to my left. The work became more extensive as I walked, eventually producing a thick and elegant pillar in my beam. Looking up, I saw it had been carved directly from living rock. 
Satisfied, I tied the rope around it, using several knots to ensure it would remain tight. Although I'd been unafraid, I did feel slightly relieved. There was no guarantee we would move around in our nightmarish sleep, and there was nobody here to watch over us. After tying the rope around my waist, I walked back over. Here, get a sample of that water, he said, handing me a jar. Don't touch it if you can help it. We'll get a sample before and after that nightmare thing that you said heals people. I nodded, then carefully flattened myself upon the stone to reach down with the jar. I could already feel that warm sleepiness brimming at the undersides of my consciousness, waiting to take me elsewhere. I almost lost the jar, water pulling at it with surprising strength. I'd underestimated the sheer power of the silent vortex. Barely catching it with my fingers, I used my other hand to pull it back up, even as sound began to fill the chamber. A terrible crescendo of clashing water echoed painfully around the dome above. You weren't kidding, Hugh shouted before the roar drowned him out. We hunkered down for thirty seconds, releasing the hands from our ears only after the disturbed water fell into the center of the whirlpool and moved off into depths unknown. Gingerly, I handed him the jar. It's warm, he exclaimed, taking it from me with wide eyes. Carefully, he placed it within a row of little boxes in his pack. Wait, should we be filming this? I dried off my hand and picked my phone out of my pocket. The device blinked and flashed at random. I already tried that, discreetly on my way out the first time. You should turn it off then he advised. That'll ruin the battery. It is off. He frowned, but said nothing else. Nothing remained but for us to sleep and experience the nightmare trial. After tying the free end of the rope around himself, Hugh clambered into an alcove behind a pillar beyond the one which I'd anchored us. Can't be too safe, he joked, masking anxiety. I've been known to sleepwalk. I looked around in the massive space and down at the wickedly strong vortex. Try not to do that here. He gave me a half-hearted smile and then sat back against a chipped painting of Buddha in a vast faded purple garden. I almost laughed at how he unknowingly mimicked the cross-legged image but thought better of saying anything further. Quietly, I sat across him in the alcove and let that subtle tether of energy flip my awareness upside down and into unknown spaces for the second time. This time, I was ready for the kick, and I pushed up through soft dirt with hands that seemed stronger than before. Muffled shouts came from my left, and I scrambled across orange-lit earth to dig him out of his grave. A moment later... I lifted his animated corpse from below, surprised to find him still wearing a rusted version of his glasses. He pushed him into place on his decayed face and looked above, his slight first caught by the rotting amber sky as mine had been. Black fingers of void still tore through that sky, arcing with curious purple flashes and bolts, though I couldn't be sure if it was exactly the same as before. Did the nightmare always start with the same setting, or was this an ongoing place that changed as the days passed? Despite missing most of his throat, he gasped, Shit, you're a zombie! Mostly, I replied quietly. Keep it down. There are things out here somewhere, where there were last time. I'm a zombie too! he cried, stumbling to his feet, his moldy eyes fixated on his emaciated limbs. Shut up! My whisper shouted. But not your hands, he pointed, staggering back. I held them up to the leering amber sky. He was right. Although dirty and bloodied, my hands were in far better shape than the rest of my corpse body. In fact, I could feel more sensation through them. 
where the rest of my body felt hollow, distant, and feeble. My hands felt almost alive. The water, I realized. I touched the water with my hands. Corpse Hugh calmed down as he focused on what he was good at, thinking. Why didn't the people you come with do that then? Why didn't they touch the water to make them stronger here? I shook my head. No idea. They seemed almost afraid of getting near it. A massive shadow moved on the horizon, even as I once more became aware of that thumping organic and mechanical heartbeat making vast undulations in the world around us. I could tell he was terrified, but I motioned for silence and began moving before he could panic again. We had indeed begun at the graveyard again, although with many less people in our undead company. Broken gravestones littered the area, each overgrown by long dead bushes and weeds. I briefly considered digging up one of the graves and checking if the bodies of Javier and his neighbors were still there, even though their minds were not. But I can almost feel those unhallowed creatures moving about on the horizon, coming our way. I clutched the graveyard's gate with one hand, momentarily stunned by how real it felt. Rusted metal moved rough and uneven against my hand, feeling every bit of it like an actual ancient gate. Heated breezes slipped between the bars, and I felt every flow along the skin of my hand. Was part of me truly alive? Worried, I bent down and took a piece of stone and used it to scratch my palm. It hurt. Dropping the stone, I carefully opened the gate, taking care not to squeal too loudly. Worry scourged through me. My hands were stronger, but I was more vulnerable. I very strongly did not want to get caught by those horrible things on the horizon, but now I realized there was another concern. Did the creatures here learn from previous visits? If we headed to the hardware store basement, would they find us immediately? An ice-cold wind moved across my hands, only to be replaced by a heated breath a moment later. I looked out across the vast landscape of blasted forests, dead trees, and crumbling buildings, but I saw no reason for the chill. Holding my hands close, now more fearful than I'd expected, I decided to abandon the previous plan. Let's go this way, I whispered. Hugh turned his gaunt face toward the town proper. Isn't the hardware store that way? They found us there last time, I told him, hiding the fact that the creatures had been slightly too late despite finding us. Let's go the opposite way while they look there. Accepting my answer, he stumbled along behind me on rotted ankles. I felt stronger and more capable than my previous visit, choosing routes around piles of dead trees and snapping branches out of our way with my healthy hands. I took us toward a range of hills in the distance. Silhouetted against amber and vaguely cast in dim orange, they sat crowned by the remnants of suburban houses. I was certain we could find a place to hide there. More importantly, the hills were in the opposite direction of the wet dragging and shambling sounds approaching the town. Reaching the muck-buried streets of that suburb, we delved deeper into the maze of houses, finally choosing one that seemed more intact than the rest. Within sat the eeriest sight I'd yet found. An almost normal living space, complete with decently in shape appliances, pictures stuck on the fridge, and a dusty but unbroken bed. For some reason I'd expected corpses to be lying under the sheets, but the house was empty. Hugh wavered by the fridge, the back of his exposed skull toward me. Who do you think the people in these pictures are? he asked. Do you think we could find out, visit them? What if their house looks exactly like this now? It's a nightmare, who cares? I mean, what if whatever happened here is going to happen soon? 
I opened the basement door and studied the sturdy room below and the odd unlight that had previously illuminated the hardware store basement. What, like, is this the future or something? It's our town. How would that work, though? In their nightmare, did indigenous people see the same thing as us, I asked. Hmm, I don't know. Let's go, I insisted, seeing distant shadows play on the windows. Still lost in thought despite not having a brain, he followed me downstairs and helped me stack things on the stairs to seal ourselves inside. The marching and shuffling sounds outside grew louder, soon accompanied by the unholy squishing that set even my withered teeth on edge. I wondered, how many of these things were there? Were they around the hardware store now too? Or do they have some sense of our presence? If they didn't, what were they doing? Did nightmare creatures just wander across these horrible landscapes? Hugh sat motionless, ready to leap back into reality at a moment's notice. But I noticed that, this time, there were no snuffling noises. As if whatever had sniffed us out last time was not present in this contingent. Just as that tendril of electricity in my head began to flare, I heard a massive crushing impact somewhere outside, and the basement shuddered. I awoke with a stark, as did Hugh. While I turned my flashlight on my hand and found that I had a scratch on my palm, he staggered to his feet, pulled his glasses off in wonder, and stumbled right into someone. Looking up, I realized a couple of families had come down there while we were sleeping. They had no idea we were present, but we'd completed our nightmare trial just as they'd arrived, and a small child staggered on the edge. A father leapt toward him, and a terrifying moment passed in slow motion, but it wasn't enough. And the child fell into the water below with a splash. Several women screamed, and Hugh shouted. Men followed the child with beams of light in a panic, looking for an opportunity to grab him. In moments, Hugh untied himself from the rope, intending to throw it to the boy. I stood, realizing that I was already tied to both a pillar and the rope. How many seconds had passed? Ten? Fifteen? Counting in my head, I ran forward and leapt from the edge. The warm breeze intensified in the darkness before I held my breath and shot down into battering waters. Immediately set upon by terrifyingly strong force from all directions, I forced my way to the surface, thankfully lit by a dozen flashlight beams. A key! A key! shouted several men, running around the edge to point at the child sinking deeper toward the center. I saw him flailing around in terror across the vortex from me, even as I began picking up speed myself. The shouts of those around me faded as the water grew louder. Breathless, overwhelmed, and weakening as I pushed against the torrential waters, I realized I would never get across to him in time. There was only one chance, and I could see it. The pitch-black void at the center of the whirlpool, from whence that strange warm breeze emanated, and into which all light vanished. There was no time for thought. I pushed straight toward the center and fell forward into open air as the boy fell toward me. The rope snapped viciously and painfully around me as the full force of the vortex pushed down on us, but I caught him and held him fast. Unable to breathe for all the liquid ripping down our bodies, I held on for dear life. It only took a few moments, but being pulled up felt like an eternity. I can feel the hands of the community at work, pulling our rope back, and I held the boy tightly against me, my eyes fixated on the void below. Deep down, incredibly far down, impossibly far down, straight down that vortex, deep in whatever unknown spaces in the earth the waters went. Something glimmered with an almost electrical snap. The light lasted for only a split second, but I knew I had seen it. 
pulled slowly up to the edge. I handed the boy off and then collapsed on unyielding stone. As the disrupted waters fell away into that impossible darkness, I began hearing the people around me again. Shouts, cheers, claps on the back, but I processed nothing. There was something down there. I had to go down there. After Hugh's test on our samples, we would have to return with proper climbing gear. As I lay there, soaked in warm waters, a strange energy creeping into my muscles and awareness, I began thinking up the arguments I would need to convince him. I gave him one swift push, sending him reeling into the murky waters surrounding the rectangular stone portal. As if in response to our struggle, the rain sliding down from the night's shrouded trees overhead intensified. Stop it! Hugh cried, pulling him from the swamp. You're not accomplishing anything by hurting him. He doesn't even know where he is. He was right, but that fact didn't produce an iota of compassion in me for my drug adled older brother. I stood knee-high in the muck, fighting increasingly violent urges. For a moment, I just let water run down my face. Take him down there, I finally spat. It won't matter soon enough. Hugh glared back at me and helped him stumble awkwardly down into the darkness. It won't matter, I said to the pattering rains, my chest heaving as I came down from anger. Hugh was proof enough that no injury I caused would matter. His unfettered glare had been all the more pointed without glasses in the way. Glasses he no longer needed after a single visit into the strange cavern under this muggy swamp. He'd been concerned at that healing because nearsightedness is not a defect, as he'd complained several times over the week that it took to find my brother's rotting shack. It's not a cut or a broken bone. It's mostly genetic, and it's not obvious that a misshapen eye is something that needs fixed. Not obvious to an inanimate force, he'd meant. As he'd continually tried to define what healing even meant in specific terms. Were cells reconstructed and placed in perfect alignment with the body? How did the force at work determine which cells were needed and where? What happened to mass that needed to be taken away, like scabs, dead tissues, tumors? What mechanism enabled all this, and what power source? I had no answers for him. Not yet. All I knew was that something massive resided miles below that vast silent whirlpool, and I had to see it for myself. I could feel it, even now, in the form of a subtle electricity running up through the rainwater pouring into our tunnel and radiating out through the swamp's sloshing mire. Carefully stepping down those ancient stairs, my booted feet splashing in rushing torrents, I followed the current toward the underground dome. A constant roar filled the place as the stream of rainwater beneath my feet poured past the ledge and into the vortex, disrupting its smooth flow. Shining my flashlight around, I traced the mist, spray, and rough waters, making sure that we were not in any extra danger. Although the pool was choppy, the circular ledge around the base of the dome still seemed safe enough. I put my hefty pack down, but hesitated just before I put a bit of cotton in each ear. I had the oddest sense that the hollow chamber was almost angry, somehow, as if the ongoing roar was... A shout of trespass. Shaking my head, I cast aside the ridiculous notion. It was just rainwater and chop. Hugh was convinced that there was some sort of intellect at work here, but I felt no overt consciousness in any of our explorations. If something down there was truly aware, why would it sit underground for centuries, healing random visitors through nightmares? The idea of an actual living intelligence at work just didn't seem plausible to my instincts. We'd come later at night than ever before, 
There would be no surprise visitors while we slept. Traversing the entire circular ledge for the first time, I shined my light in those turbulent waters, looking for the source. I finally found it, pouring from a natural and barely visible opening exactly at the lip of the vortex. An angled channel that perfectly enabled the circular spin that had so exactingly carved the silent whirlpool over the ages. I stood above that channel, studying the elaborate art of the long-dead visitors that had also found the same source and tried to enshrine it. Among a series of religious icons, faded paint depicted a hill crowned by crumbling structures. After a few moments' study, I frowned. I jumped toward the wall and turned as something touched my back. Hugh held up his hands in light and surprise. Sorry, he mouthed, his words lost in the roar. He pointed toward a carefully placed flashlight on my semi-comatose brother, weighted down in an alcove across the gulf. We're ready. I nodded, but I didn't tell him about the painting I'd seen. He'd never go back to the nightmare with me if he knew what had been depicted. I walked back round with him and took a position next to my brother. I fell asleep under that curious heavy influence while my eyes were still half open. My sight taking in my brother's sunken purple sockets, drawn skin, and decaying teeth. He already looked half the corpse he was about to become. This nightmare trial and impossible healing might not have been what our mother and father wanted for him, but they weren't around to protest. Dirt fell away from me, like so much splattered rain as I forced my way up. Healthy, strong, and even feeling empowered, I burst forth from my grave with a fully living body. Exactly as Hugh had feared. I wasn't afraid. Although I was vulnerable, I felt strong and capable, and more than able to evade whatever slimy things moved around in the dark of this otherworldly haunt. Except it didn't look like anything in the nightmares I remembered. Momentarily stunned, I stared around at a world cast in a completely different color. Where once rotting amber marred by black fingers had hung overhead, I now saw flaring yellow and searing cerulean. Squinting up against the pain, I stumbled over onto the grave, just in time for a decrepit version of my brother to erupt from the dirt in panic. Hugh arose next to him. It's like I thought. You're fully here because you jumped into the water. What the hell is going on? My brother asked, lifting his bone and blackened fresh arms. Am I finally dead? Still squinting against the painful glare, bombarding me from every direction, I shook my head. Dan? He stared at me. Why are you here? Do you still feel the lifeline? Hugh asked me, concerned. I nodded, keeping my head low and my eyes half closed. I'll go back the moment I sense trouble. I have no intention of dying here. So, we are alive, Dan asked, his bone, bare jaw moving with his words. I don't feel high or sick. What did you give me? Nothing, I growled, stumbling to my feet. Stick with you and don't wake up until it's over. Why? Just listen to me! I shouted at him, not caring if my voice traveled. I couldn't see shadows moving on the horizon. I couldn't see much of anything in the burning wastes outside the graveyard. But I wasn't about to assume we were safe. Peering up with watering eyes, I studied the sky. What do you see? Hugh asked, helping my brother to his partially missing feet. It's not what we thought. I forced out, taking a few steps forward. Take care of him. I have to check something. Before he could protest, I broke out in a run, knowing that I only had a limited time. I slipped through the graveyard's gate and bolted across the blasted forest wasteland at a pace multiple times faster than my corpse had ever managed. I could see now 
that the felled trees were not simply rotting where they'd fallen. They'd been burned. Their blackened trunks caved and crumpled as I leapt across them. The pattern of burning was curious. I took a short moment to study the char and the liquid patterns carved along them. It was as if every trunk had been harvested by acid rather than fire. I slowed for just a moment as that horrible sound began reaching my awareness, that monstrous heartbeat in the sky, but this time the detail and intensity were far greater. I could hear nuances of breathy mechanical pulsing in between the heavy squishing drumbeat that sounded every few seconds loud enough to subtly vibrate the very earth beneath my feet. Looking down, I frowned. I still had my shoes, and all my clothes for that matter. Hugh had come last time with rusted glasses, but my clothes were nothing worse than dirty. The landscape was brutal and painful, filled with debris and sharp rocks, so I was thankful for my shoes, but it still seemed odd. Had the water of the vortex affected them as well? Had I come in the same clothes as last week? I couldn't remember. And there was nothing in the water anyway, as far as Hugh's test has shown. The jars we'd taken had held nothing but dirt and water. Nearing the hill crowned with ruined houses, the suburb we'd taken refuge in last time and the subject of the painting I'd seen, I looked back toward the horizon from whence the unknown nightmarish creatures usually came. With better eyesight, I saw something seething all across the distance. Not just silhouettes, but weirdly colored shapes moving against flaring yellow and searing cerulean blinking against the pain. I turned and ran. I had a very specific question in mind, and I raced to the house we'd hidden in last time. The same dusty kitchen remained within, complete with pictures and appliances. Pulling drawers and opening cabinets, I looked for anything that might have a date on it, but all the paper in the house had molded over with a light orange dusting that I thought better of touching. Peering at the back of the photos on the fridge, I saw it creeping along the paper there as well. As if everything, even slightly organic, was being eaten. My eyes lit upon a small, black rectangle on one of the chairs in the kitchen. A phone. I picked it up, instinctively pressing the power button. Against all odds, it began turning on. What were the chances that it still had battery life? It lit up just long enough to flash the time and date on the screen and then blinked back off. The last of its power drained. I dropped it, stunned. October 2nd. Was that when the phone had been last turned on or was that to date now? The painting on the wall of the vortex chamber confirmed that this was the same nightmare every visitor had always had. They'd always been dreaming of this era in time, complete with the hardware store I knew and the suburbs I'd matched to the maps of the area. How many hundreds of years had people been sleeping around that whirlpool and having nightmares about their future and my present? What were the odds that I would come here and find this nightmare reality was a week away. Feeling lightheaded, I clutched the table, but it snapped under my hands, all strength drained from it, just like the corpse Hugh and my brother walked around in, just like the paper in the house, just like the trees littering the hills outside. It could be another year, I told myself. Next year? Five? Ten from now? These buildings wouldn't change that much. I stared at the blinding light streaming in through the window for a moment, filled with undirected fear and anger, until something occurred to me, an impossible thought 
from my first steps with my empowered senses. Running upstairs, taking care not to crash through the weak steps or rotting upper hallway, I clambered my way to the attic where the roof had completely fallen away. Standing there, wincing against the sky glare, my ears filled with that distant tremendous heartbeat and the slithering and squishing sounds of approaching horror. I judged the jump. In the distance, I saw Hugh and my brother making their way toward the house. Beyond them, the entire horizon squirmed and shifted as a gigantic wall of unspeakable organic mass and sick-forming liquids roiled towards us. Even with my living eyesight, I couldn't make sense of it, but I was starting to understand nonetheless. I jumped with all my strength, ready to be cut back to reality if my hands failed. But no. My aim had been true, and my hands closed around the flaring yellow cord of flesh. It must have looked quite impossible from Hugh and my brother's perspective. To them, it probably looked like I was hanging directly from the rotting amber sky, but with my living eyesight, the perspective had been all wrong. It had never been a sky at all. It was more like the roof of a living cavern, and I began climbing up into it, fighting nausea as I pulled away deeper into heated, pulsing, and wet tubes of living matter. My sense of smell intruded upon my awareness as the blanketing smell of char and ash fell away to be replaced by gag-inducing stench, but I forced myself to keep scooting along a cluster of bright yellow cords. I wanted a higher perspective. I needed a better look. The hanging cords of flesh, once I came to thicker parts, were actually good holds for my hands and feet, and I came all the way to the edge of a massive pulsing cerulean organ. Where once I had seen a black void in the sky arcing with purple electricity, I now saw segmented cyan tissue bubbling with energy like some sort of horrific pancreas, at least in shape if not in function. Directly below, I saw Hugh and my brother reach the old house and hobble inside. From my higher angle, I squinted at the oncoming wall of horror. From here, it looked more like a writhing brown and black lake, infinitely far across and eternally deep. An oncoming ocean of hungry flesh and thirsty acid. But it still made no visual sense. Distracted by the uncontrollable urge to gag from the building stench and ichor covering me, I forced myself to throw up and watched as vomit fell to the distant ground, maybe six or seven stories below. Almost out of willpower, I decided I would keep moving, on the off chance I'd get a better perspective. Before I had the chance, the vivid cyan organ next to me began changing and moving, elongating downwards as if about to strike the earth. Instinctively, I remembered the enormous impact that had struck just before the end of our last nightmare. Is that what these organs were? Mechanical crushers of some sort, but for what purpose? As the unholy organ began preparing to slam downward, the yellow fibers to which I clung rose, and I gripped them in a panic, but... I didn't pull on my mental lifeline because this was faster than any climb. Soaring upwards, I stared into the distance, my eyes locked open despite the competing glares. The sky flesh lifted higher, bringing me what seemed like miles into the air, and I saw. Too often, I'd been stunned and dumbfounded by awe. Now, I took in the sight with a sick despair that matched my nausea and revulsion. Somewhere... In the back of my mind, I'd expected a terrible revelation, and this only made me feel grimly justified in my dangerous pursuit of the truth. Not wanting to be crushed or cast down by the cerulean to organ's imminent impact, I pulled on my mental connection to reality early for the first time. The energy flared, and I soared backward in thought. I awoke in gentle gloom, our flashlight still aimed at the nearby pillar. I sat in silence for a time, waiting. I slowly realized that the rain outside must have stopped, if it was silent down here. 
Although only an instant had been left in that nightmare, it took the two of them several minutes to wake up. My brother shot up gasping. I quickly held him back and shined the flashlight on his features. His sunken purple eyes were now smooth, whole, and bright. His teeth looked professionally restored, and his swallow skin had become smooth and healthy. He looked down at his hands, then at me, and then back at his hands again, and then he began crying. Rather than ask me questions about the insane experience he'd just been through, perhaps he chalked it up to a bad trip. He just rocked in place, overwhelmed by his healing. With his new clarity and awareness, I could see him begin to understand everything he'd done for the last few years. I'm so sorry, he sobbed repeatedly. My anger and resentment gone for the moment I held him under one of my arms. It's fine. Hugh watched in silence, concerned and moved. I caught his gaze. We have a problem, I said quietly between my brother's sobs. He nodded as if he expected my words. What were you climbing on in the sky? What did you see? Moving my jaw back and forth, considering how to tell him, I decided to answer both questions with one statement. Above that seething, endless nightmare ocean, impossibly distant but massive enough to still dominate the sky just past the line of the horizon. I'd seen half in an immediately recognizable red orb. It had crested the edge of its own limitless ocean of writhing acid and flesh, slowly sliding deeper. There was no other way to say it, except directly. I saw Mars. His lips curled up lightly with confused humor. What? Like, I saw the planet Mars. I interrupted. Large, in the sky like a moon. But I only saw half of it. Half of it? He asked, his humor fading into resigned fear. I nodded. It was being digested. Just like us. That's the sounds you hear, and that's what chases us in that nightmare. The earth is being digested. Well then, yes, I answered his unspoken question. It's not a sky at all I was climbing on. It's a lining, a wall, I think. I think it's a stomach. What the hell, he breathed. That's not the worst part, I told him, feeling nothing but grim certainty. I found the date. The 2nd of October. He gulped. What year? I shook my head slowly, still holding my brother as he cried. Hugh stood, took a deep breath, and approached the ledge. He shined his light at the center of the vortex and watched the smooth water for a long moment. We gotta get down there. That's what I've been saying. He said nothing further, his gaze locked on the whirlpool's center. I knew what he was thinking, for I was thinking it too. The scale of that threat in the nightmare world was beyond belief, beyond comprehension, and beyond any resistance by a few individual men. Yet something beneath this healing vortex was connected to it, and there was still time to find out why. Somehow, in an ancient cave under earth, hidden by darkness and swamp, there still remained an unknown hope. Though how a hidden source of quiet healing might be related to a monstrous solar system eating abomination, I had no idea. I looked down at my brother, now that he'd finally quieted. This wasn't part of the plan, but things had become far graver than I'd ever expected. Dan, I need your help. I'm not good for anything, man, he mumbled. 
You don't have to do anything except come with us, I insisted. Hugh, I can't do this alone. We brought all the climbing gear we need. We're going to climb down there, and we're going to figure this all out. There's nobody else I can trust with this, and there's no more time to try and convince anyone else. I need you here, and I need you to do this. He hesitated for a long moment, but then nodded weakly. Is this really happening? Unfortunately, yes. I stood and walked over to my pack to begin pulling out climbing gear bit by bit. Hugh pulled out his pack from an alcove and began doing the same. Our preparations went as quietly as the vortex by which we stood, and silently as the unknown force which awaited us below. I ran through the swamp, carrying more gear stolen from the construction site at work. Our first two attempts had failed, as the hole had been far deeper than we'd expected. Filled with anxious energy, I rushed back through the waters lit by the rising peach light of dawn. The tunnel opened up before me, and I climbed down ancient stairs in between close rock walls. I had the oddest sense that the tunnel was getting slightly smaller with each visit. But it had been here for hundreds of years, so it must have just been my imagination. I felt a brief panic at the thought that it might somehow close and trap us underneath the earth, but forced myself to ignore the thought. Coming out into the massive dome above the silent spinning waters, I noted Hughes and my brother's progress. They managed to hook up cables between several opposite pillars, forming a framework to unspool a line straight down from above the center of the vortex. They'd also set up several lights powered by a small generator, so for the first time I got a good look at the entire domed chamber. Dropping two heavy coils of cable and slinging my backpack down, I circled the ledge. The dome above was covered in engravings and paintings from many different cultures. Apparently, we would not be the first to climb around this cavern. I doubted that any men of the past had climbed down into the center of the whirlpool, though. Aside from the obvious respect most had for the place, the whirlpool's dark center was only barely wide enough for a person now, and would have only been narrower before grinding work of centuries of flowing water. Think we got enough line now? Hugh asked, carrying one of the coiled piles to our winch. I thought about it for a moment. Hugh had gone the first time, and I'd gone the second, but neither of us had physically reached anything of note. I think so. Last time I saw the flickering light again, and it wasn't too much further down. My brother grabbed another pile of cable. I should be the one to go in this time. I want to go again, I replied. He pushed up against me aggressively. You don't trust me? Years ago, my older brother had been taller than me, but he was now half an inch shorter than I, and extremely thin besides. Whatever intimidation factor he'd once held over me, it was no longer there. It's not an issue of trust. I want to see it for myself. I have to. It's fine, Dan, Hugh added. We probably still don't have enough to reach the bottom anyway. He backed off, still sullen. Wasting no more time, I strapped on the climbing harness and hooked myself up to the cables we'd set up. A few minutes later, after checking and double-checking everything, I donned some gloves and climbed out to the center. Hanging there, directly above the center, I still felt chills. It looked, for all intents and purposes, like a black hole feasting on light and water. I'd been down there once before, but that didn't make this second moment of anticipation any easier. Slowly, they began lowering me. Passing the point where I'd fallen out and caught a boy, I watched the tightly curved vertical flows as they rose around me like crystalline walls. 
The center of the whirlpool remained at a slight downward angle for quite some distance, ever so slowly closing in on me. In keeping with the waters aligned, long after I descended into darkness. Breaking out my flashlight, I shined it around, checking the smooth, silent waters nervously. There was nothing to see, really, but that didn't stop part of me thinking that this was a monumentally dangerous idea. There was no mental lifeline here to drag me back to some other reality. This was real, and I was being lowered down a deathly shaft with absolutely no chance for survival if the cable failed. I took a deep breath and forced myself to calm down. There was no choice. Not really. It was either risk this or burn alive the 2nd of October sometime in the next few years as something enormous swallowed and digested the entire planet. Put that way, I felt much better about what I was doing. That conviction helped as the smooth waters narrowed nearly to a point. I found myself immediately drenched, holding my breath. I squeezed my eyes shut and held on tightly as rocks squeezed and almost completely on all sides. Warm water piled up above me, sloshing and roaring, covering my head, and then... I was through. The droning sound of rough water began reaching my ears as I entered the area where the water lost cohesion and simply began falling straight down. Having reached this depth before, I knew that the living rock began expanding bit by bit, forming a shape which encouraged the sound to radiate down rather than up. One reason, I guessed, why the dome chamber a mile above was so quiet. I shined my flashlight out from the center of the expanding waterfall through which I was descending, but still, I saw nothing but rocks slopping away at the darkness and mist below. This is where the cable had run out last time, and where I had been forced to use the simple signaling button at my waist. I stared downward as the walls continued sliding up past me. The falling water became a heavy droplet-filled mist, lifting some of the water's pressure from my shoulders. There. Some sort of white light arced past the darkness below, far more clear and close than the vestiges I'd seen when I grabbed that boy. I knew immediately that I was going to reach it this time. Shining my flashlight down, I watched breathless as my hanging feet approached something solid. Finally, the moment came and I slid into a waist-deep pool of flowing warm water that constantly roiled with the following scattered column from above. Quickly pressing the middle button on my signal device, I communicated stop before the cable coiled up too much underwater. Waiting around the pool, shining my light into the dark water, I found no threat, but still... I clambered about as soon as possible, my subconscious filling with thoughts with fears of unseen creeping things. I found that I was in a tunnel of sorts that closed to a long point at one end and opened into further darkness at the other. The pool's overflow continued down in that direction, sliding away like a wide, bubbly, flat river. Unhooking myself from the harness, I sat on mossy rock for a time, thinking about what to do next. It was oddly warm down there, and I'd never seen the moss that far underground. Didn't they need light? At that thought, the arcing energy I'd seen twice radiated again. I watched, stunned, as a cord of bright white electricity flared out from the darkness, through the pool, and up toward the pointed end of the tunnel. Getting close with my flashlight, I found the carrier a whitish, transparent substance wrapped tightly around itself, much like the cable I'd ridden down on. I didn't dare touch it, but I could certainly follow it. I had 30 minutes without communication before they'd pull up the cable and try to come down after me. Checking my watch, I kept my flashlight aimed forward, carefully followed the river. 
As I proceeded down the gently sloped tunnel, I felt the humidity and heat increasing, and I noticed the organic cable in the middle of the floor was gradually growing wider. By the time I came to a large opening, it had grown to several feet in width, and my attempts to stay on the rock and avoid touching it were becoming increasingly difficult. To get through to the next area, I was forced to touch it. But I waited until the next pulse of electricity to gingerly touch it with my boot. It gave slightly under my weight, but nothing else happened. I had the fear that it might open somehow and suddenly swallow me up, but I had no other choice. Moving forward along the thick white pathway as the surrounding rock dropped away, I found myself walking along what amounted to be an organic causeway suspended in empty air. A small flow from the river still bubbled along its direct center, but the rest had slipped off the curved edges. I wanted to shine my flashlight over and see how far the drop was, but I wasn't about to risk getting close to the void. I didn't like walking across whatever this stuff was, but as long as nothing dangerous appeared, I told myself I'd probably be fine. There were no animals down here for something carnivorous to feast on, so this had to be... I understood my miscalculation, even as another pulse of energy arced out of the darkness ahead. It came at me, like a blazing silent train, and a bolt of heat seemed to slam up into my chest through my feet. Eye-watering yellow and agonizing cerulean assaulted my cavern, adjusted sight as I fell to my knees in acid-scorched dirt. Despite the intense shock, I knew exactly where I was. In fact, blinking through tears to study my immediate surroundings, I saw the hardware store and the rock that the family had used to hide their stay in the basement. Were they inside there now? Nothing seemed too impossible anymore, not even ending up in another night stream. Breathing hard, I scrambled in the dirt around the clock, trying to move it, but rotted hands in number were stronger than my limbs alone. Within, I could hear people whispering and huddling in fear. Looking to my right, I saw writhing flesh at the edge of the acid ocean approaching. Great tentacles of gnashing, faceless mouths and grinding, unidentifiable masses intent on breaking up matter for easier digestion. It was those masses that would reach these buildings first. But I knew the dream would end for them before the distant acid poured across the city. But would it end for me? Terrified, I ran, bolting through the charred town. I had no love for the place, not really, but to see it like this, to see the melted bodies in the streets and the burnt state of restaurants I recognized and fast food signs I passed every day. Looking back, I saw a building near the hiding family's collapse throwing its pointy metallic roof down at an angle to crash into the side of the store. It was the same dream, my first. I remembered that inexplicable metal bar very vividly. Was I, then, the source of the scuffling I'd heard outside? To distorted, rotting ears had my hard breathing sounded alien and terrifying. And the dream had ended just after... White flaring energies receded from my awareness, and I fell to my knees in blessed humid darkness. The pulse's light faded as I continued down the line, and I realized that I'd only been gone a split second. I stared down at the semi-transparent white bridge of organic matter, shining my flashlight within. It seemed filled with unidentifiable lines of darker tissue and weird nodules. I thought something strange might be down here, but this? Had I just crossed time and dimension purely by touching the edges of a pulse through this... thing? I stood suddenly, my brain piecing something together. The nightmare experience is above. Did some minuscule bit of connection travel up the waterfall, up the vortex, and into the air of the chamber above? Was the connection so small there that only those sleeping could truly connect with it? 
I'd felt it in the swamp, the night of the rains, when the water's trail had it connected up all the way to the surface. Moving on with increased determination and grim curiosity, I followed the ever-thickening bridge deeper into the void. The cavern walls fell away until my flashlight found nothing on any side except an impenetrable black. Warm breezes appeared, filled with an ungodly stench that forced me to pull out two bits of wet cotton and plug my nose lest I pass out from sheer nausea. I sensed an incredible space opening before me, but I saw nothing until another pulse of light came. This time I had the opportunity to see the source. An enormous burst of blindingly white light coalesced miles before and above me, as much like a flickering sun as anything else I could think of. It filled a corridor in my sight, despite being miles away, and I knew that this had to be the source of the strange power here. The colossal sight simply defied belief. A pulsing star under Earth, briefly lighting a tremendous cavern and then sending out its energy like so many tracers. Tracers which extended in a thousand directions, left, right, up, down. One of those pulses of electricity came to me, traveling along my living bridge with a ghastly speed. It was only by virtue of my extreme distance from the underground celestial object that I had any chance to react at all, and react I did. Falling to my side while I stood in awe, my flashlight illuminated a surface that had come up to meet my living bridge and I leapt for its surface without truly considering my actions. As the pulse flared past harmlessly, I plopped into some sort of goo and then slowly squished down further under my own weight. Again, overcome by fear of unknown lurking creatures, I scrambled up onto firmer ground which offered no comfort at all. Still squishy and wet, I shined my flashlight at it. This was no cavern floor. I crawled along gray flesh, patterned with wide corrugations several feet across. I had the distinct impression that this was some sort of horribly large brain matter, and I stumbled my feet out of the disgusted horror. I sought to wipe my hands, but I was already covered in thick crimson liquid that shared the coppery, pungent scent of blood. In fact... Shining my light around, I noted rivers of the stuff moving slowly among the hills of brain matter. A fleshy, living nightmare landscape underneath the earth, lit by distant pulses of unholy living light. Pressure twisted around my heart and around my head, my pulse racing with absolute panic. This was... Oh God, I had no idea. I literally had no idea, no guess as to the insane nature of the place I'd found. It seemed like blood and brain matter, but it wasn't a brain, nor a body. Large clusters of rock still jutted forth, proving that the cavern floor was only a few feet beneath, and the layout of the hills and valleys were all wrong. The flesh was laid out in vast tracks, rather than formed into a cohesive organ. What the hell was the purpose of this place? What could it possibly be? Logic and guesswork had gotten me this far, but this? What the hell was this? It was miles long and miles wide, a city of patchwork tissues and darkness. It just made no sense. A nearby squirting and scrunching broke me from my awe. Shining my flashlight to my right, I saw long, white, and goopy segmented tubes sliding along the brain matter toward me. It was maybe the length of a person's height, all told, and... It was a maggot. It was a six foot long maggot, feasting on brain and blood. Behind it, a dozen more crawled from the sickening river, leaping for the bridge of white. I pulled at cords and climbed my way back up. The maggots munched hungrily on tissue, ignoring me, and I watched as all the oozing past they left behind almost immediately healed back up. My heart came down from the edge of panic as that clue brought back my original mission. These valleys of brain and blood were healing, just as we had been healed. The source was still down here. Perhaps all this was simply a horrifying side effect of the healing energy. Perhaps there was no purpose to this place. Perhaps 
It was all just an accidental byproduct of abundant life energy. Clinging to that small shred of sense, I felt the walls of my sanity strengthening once more. There had to be sense. There had to be logic. Yes. Yes. I stood again and let myself have a moment of calm. All right. How could this be connected to the destruction of Earth and Mars and our nightmare future? Despite the landscape of brain matter oozing blood and man-sized maggots, there was no immediate danger here. This was all healing and regeneration taken to extremes. I saw no beast and felt no mind at work, and I certainly didn't see any monstrous entity capable of eating a solar system. This place was odd and disgusting, but... I briefly climbed off my bridge again as another pulse flared and passed. Quickly lifting myself back up, avoid touching the grisly mess below any longer than I had to, I regarded the fading glow of the celestial cluster above me in the distance. That had to be the source. But what was it? I wiped drying red ooze from my watch and checked. It was time to head back. In any case, I needed my companions to see this. There was no way they would believe me on word alone. Now more confident in my weird living bridge, I began running back, intent on avoiding any more pulses of energy. As I ran, I felt filled with strength and deft enough to avoid twisted cords on my path. Where I should have been tired, I only felt empowered, and the joy of running seemed to overshadow any fears and disgust I had about what I'd seen. Exhilarated, I reached the pool at the top of the tunnel, hooked myself back in, and signaled to be pulled back up. It was pure dumb luck that I didn't have explosives on me that morning. It was the only trip back into town that day that I decided to take a short rest. I was feeling incredibly strong and energetic lately, but slogging through swamp and climbing underground for nearly a week straight had been taking a toll. Two men stood out my door as I approached. One was slightly taller than the other, with a near bus cut, and the other wore a hat. Both wore sunglasses, and both stood as if they'd knocked only moments ago. One turned around and eyed me suspiciously. The other noticed turned and called my name. They were dressed plainly enough, but it was immediately obvious that these were no mere citizens. Yes? I asked, stopping a few feet away. The smaller man with the hat angled his head up slightly to look me in the eyes. Doesn't this guy's file say he's 5'10"? The taller one snickered. <laughs> Looks 5'10 to me, buddy. Ah, shove it. You been out hunting, friend? The smaller one continued, noticing my dirty clothes. I had to give it to him. He actually sounded sincerely amicable, even though I knew he was fiending in an easy manner to put me off guard. I said nothing, wondering if anything I said would only get me caught in a lie. Look, we're not here in an official capacity. Not yet, the taller man said stepping a bit closer. There's been... Well... Let's call it a logistical issue for now. A rather large amount of explosives is missing from a site your construction company is working on. Homeland Security doesn't like missing explosives. Have you noticed any of your co-workers expressing an anti-American sentiment? The shorter man picked up the flow without missing a beat. Perhaps some of the illegals you work with. He gave a slight smile. Relax. We know. There are tons of immigrants and stowaways coming here all the time, taking jobs and the like. You wouldn't defend a possible terrorist, would you? I hoped for one more day before the missing explosives were noticed. Now was the absolute worst time to get caught. I was well aware of the date, October 2nd, possibly the last day of existence for the human race. I kid, I kid, he said after a beat. But in all seriousness, 
If you have anything to do with those missing explosives, you should go ahead and tell us now. It'll be easier for you. Your boss said you've been taking off work sick this week. You don't look sick. With the vector of his probing changing constantly, I found myself unable to come up with a plausible lie that I could use to defend myself against so many questions. What was the intent? The gears of my thoughts turned furiously as I tried to see a way out of this that might... Wait. I took one step forward, and both men straightened warily in response. Do you have any pull with the military? Having never gotten such a response before, the smaller man's jaw went slack for a split second. Wait, why? Do you know something? His companion asked, suddenly serious. If these men had access to more serious tools of destruction, perhaps there was a way forward after all. Our plan had been cobbled together with materials we could steal. Googled knowledge and desperation was not at all guaranteed to work. It's a long story, but I need you to listen to all of it. Word for word. It's important. The taller man nodded, his expression hard and unreadable. Go ahead. I recounted the events leading up to today as best I could, and then began telling them about my last few days, including the truth of what I found. I stood at the threshold of the massive cave with my brother, staring out across a valley of blood and brain matter lit by pulsing white energy borne by a weird organic star set in the vast cavernous ceiling distant and above. I've seen this before. He murmured. I turned my head sharply. What? When? I took a deep breath. And then he looked away, unable to face me. In, uh, in dreams. When I was high. I resisted the urge to push him off our white, ropey bridge of living matter took a very different kind of deep breath before responding. You saw this? He nodded. I hated being alive. I still do. I don't know if it was me or... This thing. What does that mean? He was either unable or unwilling to speak further on the subject. I let the issue go. He was never good with words. For that matter, I was never good myself, not until repeated encounters with the energy here. I felt sharper and stronger in a myriad of unclassifiable ways. I had the words to describe exactly how I felt and the motions to carry out exactly what I wanted to do. Life hadn't always felt this way. We carried on deeper into the cavern along our living bridge. He shined his flashlight down often, staring at disgust at the rivers of blood, hills of brain matter. He shined his flashlight down often, staring in disgust at the rivers of blood, hills of brain matter, and intermittent ropes of what looked like skin, growing weird vines between them. You weren't kidding. Is Hugh right, do you think? Is this the... Reservoir of living stuff it uses to heal people? Seems likely, I responded absentmindedly, my eyes up ahead. The living white bridge went off past the limit of my flashlight, but I could tell that it was beginning to curve up. I'd also noticed after a second trip down that a thousand other white tendrils extended out through the cave system, all originating at the pulsing source in the underground sky. Do you think... There are teeth down there? My brother asked, leaning a bit too far. In slow motion, the white cords underneath his shoes squished and gave just enough to tip him over. Quickly moving to the curved edge, I reached down. Come on! Panicking, he tried to get his bearings on the large pad of gray corrugated flesh. Panicking, he tried to get his bearings on the large pad of gray corrugated flesh. 
A nearby six-foot-long maggot moved toward him, and he aggressively kicked at its gnashing jaws until it rolled to the side and splashed into flowing blood. Terrified, he looked up, seeking the light from my flashlight, but it quickly blurred it out under oncoming glare. I only realized my mistake at the last moment, but there was no time to escape. The pulse approaching through the living bridge flared forward with blinding speed. This close to the source, it was far brighter and stronger, and I only managed to stand upright by the time it reached me. An overwhelming surge of electricity rushed through my body, mind, and awareness. A vast plane of searing heat and endless light compressed and contorted around me. An immersed roar filled my healing, and the horrific stench of that living cavern left my senses. A sphere of indescribable sensation seemed to surround me and rotate before suddenly abating, leaving absolutely nothing. I felt strong. No, I, I felt capable. The universe burst forth before me in vivid colors across an endless spectrum. It was an ocean, now that I could see it as it truly was, an ocean of energies. Light, gravity, radiations, enormous and small, it was all the same. There were currents on the sea, and I drifted. A small rock came across my senses. It was just a pebble, really, but it teemed with little unfits of cohesive matter that moved about their own volition. If I focused closely enough, I could hear them, hear their song and their laments. Pulling some of the endless ocean of energies toward me, I carefully crafted tiny little wonders and toys for them, and I listened as their songs changed into happy murmuring and secure chirping. That beauty caused a stirring inside me, and I realized with some surprise that I was an I. Though my physical form had already grown on the currents, I had only truly been born as mind swelled out of nothing and into full operation. I could look around the universe, now in wonder. I saw an elegant red spiral, and I dove among its burning spheres, enjoying the feel of its new and interesting radiations. Other phenomenon held my fleeting interest too, but I always returned to my pebble. The organisms there grew in number, and even spread to other nearby pebbles. I did my best to keep their songs happy, even as they became smaller and harder to hear. No. It was I that was growing. I soon found myself forced to sit outside their cluster of burning spheres and listen from afar nearly in vain. Their songs seemed sad and forlorn no matter what I tried to do, and I found it increasingly difficult to understand or craft anything small enough to help them. After another stretch of time, I felt a curious strength harden my thoughts. My awareness solidified in a new way. My thoughts became completely coherent. It was then that I noticed that I was two minds, one enormous and one tiny. One of me looked in from outside, a foreign part of me, a tiny little willful bit of organic matter from somewhere else. Was I sick? Had I been infected by a parasite? Carefully, I pried away that tiny part of me. Blazing electricity roared away, leaving me stunned and imminently mortal again. Falling to my hands and knees on the hard white tissue, I retched uncontrollably. What happened? My brother screamed, climbing up after tremendous effort. Jesus Christ, I thought you were dead. Wide-eyed, I stared down at my vomit pooling on the transparent white membrane between closed fists. Arcing energies danced around in my head and across my body, fading with each passing second. My brother kept shouting at me, but I heard nothing, my mind burning from the impossible things I'd experienced. I saw it. I choked out, my eyes watering from the fiery pain in my throat. I saw it. Where? he asked, then amended his question. What was it like? I shook my head. 
I, I'm not sure what it's like. I was part of it. I felt what it felt. I think I watched it being born. It was huge, even at the beginning, and grew bigger than a galaxy, but it never ate planets. In fact, it, it helped people. I think I'm pretty sure it loved them. I managed to look up at my brother, but he just stared at me in confusion. I knew what we had to do. Get back to the cables, I told him, wiping my face and mouth before standing. I have to find out more. He shook his head. You can't do this alone. I can't guarantee that it's safe. Then let me do it alone. Nobody will miss one less druggy. I glared. It was clear he wasn't going to listen to me. He never had. Then wait right there. Avoid the pulses and make sure to get me if I pass out or something. Where are you going? Up there, I told him, heading up the curving living bridge and toward the source. Stay here. Finally, he did as I asked, and I started running up the thickening mass as it grew to nearly 20 feet wide, precluding any danger of accidentally falling off. It didn't seem to get much wider in diameter ahead, but it did start rising up at a sharper angle. And then the next pulse approached. I bent down on one knee, preparing. This close, the pulse was like a gigantic fist of lightning, blasting forth from above. It bellowed as it descended upon me, and I felt my existence shrink, flatten, and attenuate. I stood atop a very different kind of sea, an endless froth of bubbles surged and waved underneath me, peering at them. I knew each bubble to be a universe in and of itself. Some part of me still remembered that one contained the minuscule currents along which I'd been born, and that pebble I briefly loved, but there were so many, and violence was the order of time now. An incalculably enormous entity towered above us, flailing blindly, destroying my kin and universe bubbles alike across dimensions untold. Indescribable, ungeometric weapons crossed the gulf between defender and destroyer, wreaking havoc, but the unsighted and instinctively vicious response was equally as devastating. Angrily, I noticed my childhood parasite had returned, and I spared only the slightest energy to cast it away once more. Like a receding tide, the lightning fell away and continued on away from me, leaving me sick and feeble on my organic white slope. The feeling faded almost immediately, and I found myself filled with strength once more. In fact, I felt healthier and more capable than the moment I'd arrived. Heated energy filled my veins, and I took off straight up the slope, even as it became more climb than run. At that pace, it didn't take me long to reach the curved, transparent wall of the source. It towered above, below, and to the sides, a gigantic, irregular sphere made of some unidentifiable matter that transmitted electricity and pulsing internal cords many times the thickness of a man. I held my hand to that surface directly, just in time for the pulse. I sat in shrouded darkness, wounded and burning, and deep bitterness consumed me even faster than the flames. Why should I alone have survived? I hadn't intended to run, hadn't intended to flee to the darker wheels, only been cast there by injury in the currents. I'd seen, at the last, that universe that had held my favored pebble cast asunder by the mad, blind flailing of an entity that hadn't even known we were at war with it. We who had sailed the tides of the multiverse, annihilated by being with neither consciousness nor conscience. What cruel design lay behind the construction of existence? What was the point of awareness, of living, if everything was simply going to be destroyed at the random unseen whims of hungry and violent forces beyond comprehension? 
What nightmare was this thing that gave birth to such entities? I noticed my little parasite again, marking my third encounter. For the first time, I stopped to regard what this truly meant. Where was I from? Sifting back through our memories, I saw a pebble much like the one I'd played with in my infancy. How had a single organism, a speck of dust, come to be part of my mind three times? A year. Time. The concept, as the speck marked it, a vector. Nineteen and a half billion years, hence in a universe not even yet born. I could hide there and heal and guarantee that my hiding place would be safe from random failings of mad gods, given that that this speck still existed there. And there would be ample life and materials to consume to seed a regeneration. It didn't matter that I'd once cared for beings like them. The existence was a cruel torture, either designed by sadistic evil or crafted blindly and without awareness, just like the failing consumer of the universes. This body burned with everlasting fires, but I could grow another one. It would require a long dormancy and comprehension of mind and memory, but my regeneration core would rebuild of all those things in time. It would find a system, seed life over the millennia, and grow enough biomatter to spark the first stages. Carefully, plucking away the tiniest moat of my inner self, I flung it forward, directed at the real location and time of my little parasite. I began tumbling back down the dendrite bridge, away from the core, my morality restored. It was a dendrite I knew now, because this was the tiniest piece of a massive brain. It was a piece designed to regenerate and heal. That's what it's always done. It was what had healed those who connected with it. As the dormant, compressed mind would then lay dreaming of the day of its awakening, dreaming of the day that it would rise up, consume our solar system and more, and regenerate into the titan it had once been. And that bitterness it felt had it seeped out into the nearby world, just like those healing energies. Could I even blame my brother if the cynical bitterness of a defeated god had taken him down the terrible path he'd followed with his life? My very skin flaring from residual neural energies, I ran back down the nerve tissue bridge, breathing one more pulse along the way. I know what it is! I shouted to Dan as I finally got closer, the insane discovery brimming on my lips and waiting to be yelled forth. It's a neuron! A neuron? He shouted back, watching me rapidly approach. Aren't those supposed to be, like, really small? Human ones, yes, I panted, coming up to him. But the thing this neuron is from is bigger than you can imagine. We're going to need more explosives. You could have just told us it wasn't you, the smaller man laughed. If you wrote a book, I'll buy it, his companion jimed. Jesus, you've got quite an imagination there. Taken aback, I glared. I'm serious. That day is today. It's under that swamp right now, and... They just both laughed some more. (laughs) Alright, alright. We know you didn't take the explosive, funny guy. Still exchanging disbelieving comments with one another, they walked past me, got in a black car, and drove off. Still exchanging disbelieving comments with one another, they walked past me, got in a black car, and drove off. Still unsure whether to feel angry or relieved, I waited until I was sure they were gone before heading back to the swamp. I hadn't figured that telling them was anything but a long shot, but still, if only they'd listened. I soon slogged through shin-high water at a rapid pace, barely feeling the noon sun. There was no time to waste. I thought I heard the whine of a jet for a moment, which was unusual for the swamps, but I could see nothing through the scattered tree canopy overhead. I ducked down to the ancient stairs and crept along the cramped tunnel for what I knew would be the last time. As the dome chamber opened up before me, I saw Hugh pacing back and forth near our lights. The system we'd rigged up had been used, and one cable hung down through the center of the whirlpool. He saw me and ran around the edge. 
Your brother's down there, he exclaimed, grabbing my arm. We couldn't get any more detonation wire in time, and radio would never make it through the rock either. I didn't guess what he was up to until he was already down there. I let those words sink in for a moment. He's going to detonate the cavern, sealing himself. You stared at me with wild eyes. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault. I breathed, pushing past him to hook myself up to another cable. Sit me down. Right. I imagine what I might have said to my brother if I'd had the time, and what he might have said to me at the last, but I'd only ever been too angry with him. I never got a chance. You can't just magically get healed and then go on like you never did anything wrong, he might have said. What happened to mom and dad wasn't your fault, I might have insisted back. It doesn't matter who was driving. It would have happened the same way. I know he would have just set his jaw, ignored me, and detonated the explosives we'd set up anyway. But it didn't matter. I still wanted the chance to say it. I should have said it long ago. In the web of fate, we seemed trapped in. Past, present, future, locked in solid state. Whose fault was anything? Had this defeated God's bitterness caused my brother to do drugs that night? Had I brought the neuron here by catching that entity's awareness last week, 19 billion years in the past, thus bringing that bitterness to my town? None of it mattered anymore, and I wanted the chance to forgive him. The first explosion sounded before I even left the ledge, rumbling deep through the earth with an ominous showering of dust from overhead. Hugh had no choice but to give up and run for the tunnel as further detonations and impact shook the living rock. We pushed through in terror and then bolted up the stairs into dappled sunlight like drowning men gasping for air. Water raced by us, pouring into the hole forming above the collapsing cavern ceiling. The explosives had been intended to take down an entire building, but now they were doing far more than that. We splashed through the rapidly flowing swamp water as we made our way further from danger. Two men across the trees caught my eye. The agents from before heading in my direction. Had their disinterest been a ruse? Had they followed me? They must have known. It must have sounded like a crazy person. Look! Hugh shouted, turning to point up at the golden sky. Through an opening in the trees, I saw a gigantic neuron begin to rise through the air, its tendrils reaching out as if to grasp the very energy of life, filling the world around it. Holy shit, it's real, the shorter agent commented, splashing up to us to watch. Unbelievable, his taller friend added. But you didn't destroy it. You just freed it. The 2nd of October, like you said, not arbitrary at all. You let it out. Frozen in place by the spectacle, I wasn't sure how to respond. All four of us watched the neuron begin to rotate slightly. Our thought was the same. Were we all about to die? Was this it? I'd seen and heard many things in the course of recent events, but the only truth would come from what the mind within that core actually chose to do. I relaxed slightly as the gigantic neuron stopped rotating and then began slowly rising. Several flares of light streaked out into sight, impacting the neuron and spreading explosive flame. As we watched, two jets blurred past and overhead, almost level with the tops of the trees. They'd been the sound I'd heard before, and they were returning for another pass. Another salvo of missiles hit the rising neuron, shredding tendrils and burning away nerve tissue. We watched in awed horror as the source of the Fountain of Youth yelled back to Earth, a deflated and destroyed remnant of the regenerative core it had once been. Well, I'm really glad we're required to report potential threats, the shorter agent commented after a moment. Even ridiculous stories of arcane monsters. My brother was dead. I reeled mentally. What do you have to say? 
the taller agent asked, looking up at me. You just improperly saved the world today, guy. I did figure there was something more to your story, seeing as how your foul says you're 5'10", and you yourself are clearly over 6'6", and wearing ill-fitting clothes, but this... Saved the world? I asked, dazed. You idiots. I was going to try and grow more of its kind and take a better approach to fighting that thing that eats universes. What? they asked. Hugh nodded, aghast. I clenched a fist. There was one more pulse on the way back. I convinced it not to consume us. It wasn't coming up here to destroy the earth anymore. It was going to help us. You have doomed us all. Both agents frowned. The smaller one gulped. So, what do we do? Nothing, I shouted, filled with rage at my brother's seamless death. There's nothing we can do. We'll have no warning and no hope. One moment we'll be here and the next, the walls of the universe will be crushing us and that's it. It could be a million years, or a thousand, or even just one. It could be tomorrow, an hour from now. There's no way to know. We stood in silence as the last of the waters drained away from under us, leaving only a pathetic wasteland of mud and filth bare to the noonday sun. We stood in silence because there was nothing to say, nothing to do. Life would go on for a while. Thank you.